My name is Matt Perry and I write Frame of Motion. Frame of Motion is a React animation library that aims to make it easier to create app quality interfaces on the web. Today, I want to talk about one of its newest features, layout animations. If you're a developer, what would your reaction be if a designer presented to you a frame of prototype or an After Effects animation that looked like an App Store app, like this example here, but when I click on one of these items, it will animate smoothly into the um, full screen view. The chances are that on the web, you'd end up implementing each screen as a static view, but you wouldn't implement the layout animation between the two. And there's plenty of good reasons for this. There's time constraints, complexity, the ongoing maintenance of uh, what could become quite a messy um, bit of code. But design designers have heard this time and time again. This isn't a lack of matching ambition, though. There are valid reasons. Layout animations are tough. And in this talk, I'm going to go through some of the reasons why that's true. Then I'm going to take a look at the basic existing approaches that are available to us before um, explaining the layout projection technique that we've got now in Frame of Motion and uh, the Framer app. Uh, and we'll talk about some of the use cases and perhaps uh, look a little bit into the technical details as well. We'll also take a look at some of the downsides of this new technique. But the first thing to know is that in Frame of Motion, all of the layout animations that you just saw was created with um, to markup, simple markup that looks like this. We've got our motion component, which is the um, it's like an animated HTML or SVG component. And we've got this layout prop as well. That's all it takes to create this kind of animation. But we can do other things with it too. So for instance, we've got these items here. These are all just motion.li's. And when I shuffle them, they'll animate. <laughs> well, the first one shuffled into the same, same order, of course. Um, but when I shuffle them and they change place in the DOM, the, because we've got the layout prop attached, they'll, that layout change will be detected and it will be animated between and we can you know interrupt these and um, keep shuffling them likewise one of the um, more requested features is the ability to animate height auto as the contents of a container changes well all of the elements here have um, layout enabled so when we add uh, content and remove it the items all animate smoothly into place but this isn't just animating auto this is animating the layout changes using a performant transform property but there's no scale distortion involved so as well as the layout prop frame motion offers the layout id prop and in here we've got um, three items and each one of them has a motion div uh, you can see here that is conditionally rendered um, if that item is selected and each of these motion divs has a, a common layout id called underline so when we uh, click between uh, these different options, when one underlying component gets unmounted and the next one gets mounted, they all animate between each other as if they were just one component. So that doesn't seem so complex, but let's talk about layout animations and why they're difficult. So there's three main reasons why layout animations are a problem. The first is performance. CSS offers a number of layout systems, grid, flexbox, floats, tables, um, the final calculated layout of any web page is an interaction between all of these systems and the HTML hierarchy that they're placed on. Owing in part to this flexibility or complexity, uh, depending on where you lie on the pessimist optimist scale, these three these uh, layout ca calculations are too expensive generally to run at the 60 frames per second that we kind of require for smooth animations. And the second problem is that these are often systems of discrete rules. So for instance, what does it really mean to animate between display grid and display flex or flex end and flex start? No layout is calculated in isolation. So this is as true for height auto or animating width as it is for um, these more obviously problematic discrete rules. In fact, it is already possible to animate some of these explicit properties using CSS. So we can animate width already. But in my opinion, this results in poor visual output. So we can see with this example, um, we're going to animate when this width changes. But you can see that because of the discrete rules, and obviously line wrapping is a system of discrete rules, 
when the width gets past certain thresholds, the lines wrap. And to me, that feels a bit cheap. You can't imagine this kind of transition in Android or iOS. And likewise, because it's um, because it's layout, the the width is is snapping to full pixel value. So you, you probably can't see it too well on this video, but there's a definite uh, difference in smoothing between animating these full pixel width values and something which supports sub pixel rendering like transform. So even when animating layout is performant, I don't believe that the resultant visual output is something that we should bother to pursue anyway. Instead, what we should strive for is a system that lives apart from the messy world of CSS layout and can just interpolate between the raw visual output that these static layout systems are producing. But animating layout isn't a new problem. Any computed layout system is going to suffer the same problems. Microsoft actually has a series of patents that describe the basic approach to layout animations. And this was created in 2009, so quite a, quite a while ago. The process goes something like this. If we have a box and we want to change its layout, but animate that change, we first need to understand where the current layout is so we can snapshot it. So here we can see it's um, in the top left-hand corner and the width and height is 100. So next we want to apply the layout. So this involves making the box um, twice as big and, and moving it 100 pixels down, 100 pixels to the left. Uh, and then we want to snapshot that. So we now we've got um, the, the the properties of the two layouts and animating in the, so the Microsoft patents were about one of their own. It wasn't about the DOM at all. It was about Windows Presentation Foundation, which is a view library for Windows, um, as far as I understand it. But it's interesting just to see that they had some of the same um, some of the same limitations, but also some like unique problems. So for instance, they, in the patent, you can read that they recognize that if you were to animate this through the layout, the um, during the animation, the element would sort of like push the other components out of the way because all of the layout relies on each other. One of their ideas was simply to stop the broadcasting of layout as the animation was happening. Another idea they had was to wrap the animating component in a like a new element, essentially, that it was a layout isolation wrapper. Uh, this is something we could sort of do on the web. We have a new contain property where you could conceivably um, wrap a part of the tree in this uh, contain size layout and any changes in the layout of this element would hypothetically not affect the others. But of course, this wouldn't be respected by all browsers and you would still be um, affecting layout. And as I said before, th this isn't necessarily going to lead to the visual output that we kind of want. On the web, we do have a property that can change the size and position of an element without triggering uh, layout recalculations. That's the transform property. We already have uh, a method for animating with uh, transform. It's called flip and it was invented by uh, Paul Lewis from Google uh, years ago. And this stands for first, last, invert, play. So the first and last map to the snapshotting uh, before and after the layout has changed that we just talked about. But the key difference here is the invert. So what it means is we can we can see here so we had our um, purple box and it was here but we want to make it look as if it was in its old size and position so we can calculate a transform that will do that so in this instance we, we moved it left and right 100 pixels so we can apply minus 100 pixels to move it back into position also we made the size uh, twice as big and twice as as uh, just big actually um, on both axes though and so to make it smaller we can apply a scale of uh, 0 0.5 so from here animating um, from an old layout to a new layout is simply a matter of animating the x and y down to zero and the scale to one um, and then the and the box will animate smoothly from its its old position to to its new one and you know this works great for position so here we've got a example where when i toggle the position it will be moved using the left property by 100 pixels or something and we can see that as we um, toggle the position the box animates smoothly between the two uh, layouts and likewise we've got this um, little white child and that is animating along with it quite nicely but the problem really starts when we animate a, 
elements width and height using scale, at that point we start to suffer from scale distortion. You can see in this example, when I toggle between the two layouts, it is animating size and position correctly, but the border radius, which is the same in both both layouts, it 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 warps as during the animation. Likewise, the little child here, it's the same size in in both the layouts, but you can see that it it animates it becomes big and then it animates small and then it's small and becomes big. Uh, but like I say, this is the same in, in both layouts. And, you know, this isn't just uh, a visual distortion. When a parent animates size with scale, it doesn't just warp the appearance of things within it. It warps the coordinate space within it too. So if you see, we've got two um, identical elements here, but uh, in this first one, the it's been scaled down by half and in the first one it's it's scaled by one but both of these uh white balls have a translate x 100 pixels set to them so this is 100 pixels but here we've only got 50 pixels of movement so that's bad enough when we've got a static element but if you can imagine trying to animate both the ball and the parent as the parents animating in scale but you want to move the ball with a very specific kind of animation curve, that's going to be impossible when the rate of its movement is changing as the parent squishes and squashes. And because of these drawbacks, the complexity curve from the very simple um, box movement layout animation to something more complex like fixing the scale distortion of a child or, uh, or shared element transitions remains insurmountably steep. And the fact that this complexity curve still exists was a real problem for us when we wanted to make magic motion in Framer because, I mean, if you take a look, people can make anything that they want in, in a prototype. So here, if I, I mean, don't judge my design skills, but uh, if I just make like a little item view and maybe we've got like some placeholder text, let's see. And then, and then because we can have children of children of children, of course, we don't want them to suffer any visual distortion. So, and then when we open it, maybe we want this to animate out to a, a list item view. Um, and our text is reparented. Like we're actually gonna, you know, take elements out of their hierarchy and change the hierarchy itself. And likewise, this uh, maybe this gets bigger and this moves to the top left-hand corner. So people are really gonna be able to do or can, can do anything that they want in these prototypes. And then we link these together with the arrow tool. Uh, click on this one, preview it. Okay, so now when I click on this, it's gonna animate smoothly into its new position. So getting from flip to this is it's basically impossible. So what we want is a solution, a one size fits all layout, um, layout animation solution. And that's what we've got with layout projection. So what is layout projection? In essence, layout projection is the ability to project any element from its browser computed layout into a size and position of our own choosing using just a CSS transform. In terms of the code, we keep it in a um, we keep it in a viewport box that looks like this, and this might look familiar. We've got the top, left, right, and bottom coordinates, and if it if it does look familiar, it's probably because this is um, essentially the return type of get bound in client rect, which is the method that we use to measure the on-screen position of um, an element. So in this way, it's kind of like the inverse. Instead of measuring the bounding box of an element, we're we're deciding the bounding box of an elephant <laughs> of, an, <laughs> of an elephant. Just as Frame of Motion presents a simple API externally to users. Internally, the viewport box abstracts away the complexities of the layout projection implementation. So um, both in terms of the codes that you, the API that you interact with inside when creating a new feature, um, but also like mentally, like just to be able to conceive of new use cases and figure out how to you know, implement something, um, it really helps simplify what are otherwise quite complex problems. So what are these problems? Well, the first is obviously because of the uh, title of the talk, um, layout animations. 
So we actually follow, uh, to perform a layout animation with layout projection, we actually follow similar steps to, to the Microsoft patents or the flip technique, where um, to begin with, we measure the previous state of a, uh, of a element using get bound and client rect. Likewise, uh, well, we first need to uh, uh, remove the layout projection transform if there's one applied, but then we can, after updating the DOM, we can then measure it again with get bound in client rectangle. So, so far the steps are the same, but instead of worrying about how the element is going to be put visually back into its place, all we have to do this time is um, animate from one bounding box to the other, setting the resultant bounding box, the interim bounding box to uh, the viewport box of, of a given element. So here we've got um, animate from pop motion, we are just animating from zero to one, and we're using that progress value to mix each bounding box. We've got prev top and current top, prev left, current left, and we're mixing each of these values. And what that will do is, um, it will just inter it will it will animate the the data model, and layout projection will take care of. It doesn't matter where the element really is. Like we're just animating. We're going. We, it, it will figure out how to project the element into that viewport box on any given frame. And the nice thing about this is uh, if we take a look at our size example from before, we've got our um, our purple box. And now when we toggle between the size, the, um, the child element is actually correctly maintaining its size the whole way throughout the animation. And the reason it's doing this is because we've provided it with a viewport box as well. So layout projection, can automatically figure out how to maintain the size and position of the child, even as the scale space, the scale coordinate space is animating um, around the child. And as we can see, the, the border radius has been fixed in this instance as well. The reason for that is um, we know that the we know the viewport box, we know where this element is going to be projected to. So we know we know its size and, and position. So we know the border radius as well. Say it was 10 pixels. Well, that 10 pixels is relative to the real layout of the box. So all we have to do is figure out what that is in terms of the viewport box as a percentage and set it to that. So um, that way uh, you can see that the even as the box gets bigger and smaller, the border radius stays the same throughout the animation. So we can also use the viewport box for shared element transitions. So as we saw before this um, this example, we had uh, what, what, what was happening really is that when one of these elements is unmounting, we measure the viewport box and we set that as the previous one. Then when a new one is uh, mounted, we, all we have to do is provide it the old viewport box and then we can just perform the steps as is in the last layout example layout animation example, we can just animate from the viewport box and layout projection will take care of like where is the element really in the DOM. So this works quite well when going between elements, different elements that look quite similar to each other. But we can also uh, go between elements that look very different to each other. So for instance, the um, this is like a, a mock, again, don't, you know, I'm not a designer, but this is a mock um, iOS home screen. And when we click on the icon, it the the two animate with each other um, and crossfade between the two. And this is not too dissimilar from the previous example. The difference is we keep the old element around during the uh, during the animation. And what we do is point both the um, incoming and outgoing components to the same viewport box. So no matter where each one is in in the DOM, in, in the browser layout, they both um, will project themselves into this shared viewport box. So it looks like they overlap for the duration of the animation. And then from there, it's really just a, a matter of getting that crossfade right. So it looks and, and animates uh, smoothly. So you don't see too much distortion from either screen. But this is actually how Apple really do this transition in iOS. You can uh, record your screen and if you scrub it quite slowly, you can see them performing the same sort of trick there. So there's no difference really.
the cool thing about the viewport box is, is there's actually a lot more we can do with it. For instance, drag gestures. So here, um, in this next example, we have this this uh, draggable element. Now, normally, to make something drag, you just apply the uh, the pointer movement to the x and y transform uh, translation of a of an element, and it would move around. But we can also apply that same pointer gesture to the to the viewport box of a given element. And as the viewport box moves, the element that's performing layout projection will um, project itself into that box no matter where it is. Now, you might be thinking, well, what's the point of that? Because we're not getting it. This isn't much different to a drag. This is basically just a draggable um, box. But there's some cool things that we can do here. So for instance, if I'm dragging and for whatever reason the page scrolls, you can see the um, the elements stay stuck under the mouse. And that's a free side effect of layout projection. Now, in this instance, you might notice that there was a, a couple of flickers. This isn't like an official uh, frame of motion implementation, but um, until I move the mouse now, it doesn't it doesn't pop in. But you can see pretty much the it's, it's not it's, it's not going to be far from here to, to fixing that bug. So applying drag to the viewport box has other benefits too. So in this next example, we can see that, well, actually, let me let me open the uh, inspector and we can take a look at what's going on in the DOM as we do this. As I drag the viewport box of this element, um, and you can see the transform updating in the right-hand panel there, when I bring it over to the right side here, the element disappears. And when I bring it back and back, and back and you can see it popping in and out of the DOM. What's happening here is that we're reparenting the element. It's actually a completely different element, but we provide just as in the shared element transition, this is like a shared drag gesture transition or something. We pass the um we pass the new component, the viewport box, and tell it that there's a drag gesture going on and just to hook into that and it will carry on where the old element left off. And so finally, um, by dragging the viewport box and doing layout animations of the viewport box, these uh, all of these things can sort of like coexist and they interoperate pretty well together. So here, the uh, if I if I drag this component, you can see that the items reorder when it hits certain thresholds. Now, layout projection has no say in that. We've had to add our own reordering logic, but the point is when they do change in the DOM, all of the elements that have changed position perform a layout animation. But to make the draggable component stick under the mouse, we're actually having to do less than we normally are. We're just not animating that one. And even as it pops around in the DOM, you can see it sticks to the mouse as if it was like a one coherent element. And we've got some experimental things that I'm looking into as well. So um, one idea that I've got for the viewport box is that um, canvas elements and SVGs are just as expensive to animate um, their layout as any other image. But the difference is we have um, full control over the image that they're producing. So we can incorporate the viewport box data into the image they're producing. This example uses React 3 Fiber and it hooks into the underlying 3GS uh, camera. And every frame where the viewport box changes, we update the, uh, the, the, the aspect ratio that the canvas is rendering at. And so you get this sort of like seamless between these two completely different layouts, which are animating with transforms. We get these, um, these smooth transitions. This is a, a frame jump, but that's like a, just an, this is just a demo, but um, you can see that the, the technique there is, is one that shows quite a bit of promise and I'm looking forward to exploring this technique in the, in the, in the future. Okay, so now that we've seen the viewport box and seen uh, some of the use cases it can be applied to, let's take a look at how it can work. And I'm not going to go into uh, too much detail. If you want to know more technical details, I've got like a pretty in-depth post up at my blog, which you can, it'll be the pinned tweet on my um, Twitter account, Matt G. Perry. But just for the for the basics, we can um, open up this high fidelity uh, example here. It's cold in here. I'm going to get my hoodie on. Damn the continuity. I mean, that's not 
much better, but he'll do. Okay, so this is Excalidraw, and uh, this big box here is uh, ostensibly a, a monitor. Um, and then we've got our purple box from before, and it's Little Child. And what we need to do on any given frame is project the element from its measured layout into the viewport box that we've defined by whatever means uh, necessary. And um, so the first thing to do is we need to, from the center of each element and starting from the parent downwards uh, as, as well, we need to measure the distance between the center of the two boxes. So um, we apply a transform that will move this one over to the um, center point of the viewport box of that element. And then from there, we can stretch it out to fill up the space. This is like a roughly um, a scale two, for instance. We want to make it twice as big to fill up the viewport, uh, the viewport space. But when we apply a transform to a parent element, we're also applying it to the children. So this, we just, stretch this um so it will still be roughly overlapping the um it'll r take up roughly the same spot in the uh in the parent element but we've also made it twice as big because we stretched out we applied scale two to the to the parent so what we can do is if we've got a child that was measured along with its parent but its its parent has a transform on it we just have to make sure that that measured layout undergoes the same transformations as any parents before calculating the distance between that element and its projection box. So from here, we know that it's been stretched out. So we need to put an opposing transform on it to make sure that its, its size is reset and that it can be repositioned over the viewport box. Now, as I say, there's more technical details in the companion blog post, uh, which you can reach via the Matchy Perry Twitter. It'll be in the pinned tweet. Um, but for now, we can take a look at some of the drawbacks that layout projection um, suffers. Okay, so the um, the biggest problem with layout projection, at the risk of sounding like a job interview dickhead, is that it is too good. And by that, I bear with me. Let me show you. So the app icon to app screen transition that I showed you earlier. The first time that I... Im Hello? So the app icon to app screen transition that I showed you earlier, what I wanted to do originally was just to take the initial demo where we had the list items going from list view to full screen and doing that with layout animations. And I just wanted to drop that into a, a switch basically that said, is the app open? And if it was, uh, just animate from one to the other, render one or the other, and layout projection and the layout animations in Frame Motion would handle that transition. So I did that, and the first thing that I saw was this. So as you can see, the icon is animating as you'd expect, but the the children are all sort of like, it doesn't even look like the animation's running. Uh, it was debugging this, and it turned out the animation is running, but because layout projection can be quite sticky, um, these children, or the container around it, are detecting the scale change in the um, in this in this transition, and they're but they're saying, no, 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 I know what position, I know what size I'm meant to appear at, and they're counteracting the scale distortion to such an extreme extent that they look completely static on the screen, and. You know, I do think this probably has application, but clearly it's not what we want. We we can also uh, see this in, so here we've got like a draggable box from before, but it's got a child that itself is performing layout projection. And as I move it around, the, the, the child is perfectly counteracting the transform calculated by layout projection, um, which I'm sure has somewhere down the line we'll have some application but for now it's clearly not what we want and to, to fix this we can turn off layout projection for the children or we can um, start maybe resolving the viewport boxes relatively to the nearest layout projection parent but um, whichever we choose like there is an extra step here I think to eliminate this kind of behavior and it's not what we want basically 
So the final problem with layout projection is that it is bound to the main thread. We do a lot of per frame synchronous calculations on all of these viewport boxes and layout projections. Um, in terms of performance, it isn't strictly a problem. We find that uh, rendering is definitely way more of a of a bottleneck than the JavaScript, the synchronous JavaScript. But at the same time, like these are animations, especially shared element transitions. They're running at a time when React or your view library of choice might be doing a lot of heavy lifting, or we might be getting incoming data and needing to deal with that somehow in a way that we might need the main thread for. Um, when that happens, the the animations are going to suffer. So that's why I sort of hope as this technique uh, matures, we'll be in a better position to maybe push for a browser API that can offload some of this heavy lifting or maybe um, when the animation worker or something else, WebAssembly, becomes uh, more mature, maybe we can start looking into something like that. So thank you very much. That's that's it. That's my talk. Uh, thank you very much for watching. If you're interested in like the technical details or want to see like some of the source code behind how we perform some of these techniques, you can go to the Matchy Perry Twitter. My pin tweet will be the um, companion blog article that I have for this talk. So yeah, thanks for thanks for having me.